Welcome to The Road. This is a weekly podcast of All Saints Lutheran Church. I'm your host, John Pedersen, and I serve as pastor. Each week, we reflect on faith, life, and navigating the road ahead. The language of journey is common when we think about life. It has its joys and challenges along the way, and we all need a little encouragement and guidance at times to keep us going. There's a word in the Bible, asphalia, which means truth, but it's the same root word we use in English for asphalt, if you can believe that is a solid surface that makes travel easier and more assured. And so every week we're going to be exploring elements of faith and life that keep us on the road. Faith isn't about living a perfect life. It's about finding our way, getting through rough spots, but seeking out those great vistas too. You can find my weekly message here, but you'll also find special conversations with guests who have insights on things like wellness, parenting, and living with unique purpose. If you appreciate this podcast, remember to subscribe where possible and share it with a friend. Here's this week's message. Religious faith and spirituality point us to ultimate truths and identity. But what happens when so many traditions, rules, requirements, and trappings take up all the space and distract us from the central point of it all, God? When everything else supports our relationship with God, then it continues to have meaning and purpose. But if not, shouldn't it be reconsidered? That's really what is at the heart of today's story from John chapter 2. The question of how much is too much has been a debate in Christian communities for large portions of Christian history. It's why we have expressions of faith like the Quakers who keep everything very simple. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are Orthodox churches. Within the Lutheran movement, which is somewhere in between, you have high church expressions with lots of ceremony and low church expressions, which are simpler in structure and practice. A lot of Midwestern Lutheran churches lean toward the low church side of things. There's no one right answer. And we're all unique and find meaning in different forms of worship. But as Jesus comes to the temple in Jerusalem, he's struck by the ways in which true worship seems to have been crowded out. In one of the most provocative and emotional actions of Jesus' ministry, he drives out the merchants and money changers from the temple mount. He's providing clarity and correction about the object of worship. Worship is ultimately about connecting with God, not everything that gets built up around it. I want you to picture the scene a little bit. First of all, the temple in Jerusalem was on top of a much larger structure called the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount, which you can still visit, covers 37 acres. It's enormous in scale, built on massive stones. You sometimes get a glimpse of one of the walls of the Temple Mount, if you've ever seen a picture of the Western Wall, which is still used for prayer today. It was a wonder of the ancient world and still impressive by modern standards. When you come up the long steps, um, you would enter into the vast area outside of the temple itself. And this is where Jesus and his disciples are standing in today's story and where he finds people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. As I read this passage again, there was a detail that just really jumped out at me that hadn't hit me as clearly before. The money changers were seated at their tables. Now on the surface, that seems pretty straightforward. That's pretty common, even in modern situations for someone selling items to sit at a table. But I want you to think about the tone that conveys in a couple of ways. First, it suggests entrenchment. They're not just passing through. It's not just standing and selling animals temporarily. They're getting comfortable, right? They've taken up temporary residence. So that alone is kind of worth noting. But John often uses metaphor and dual levels of meaning, and there is another common reference to people who are seated in Scripture. In our culture, it's most common for people who are teaching or preaching to stand. But in that culture, rabbis sat down to preach. Later in John 8, we hear this. Early in the morning, Jesus came again to the temple 
all the people came to him and he sat down and began to teach them. Not only have the money changers taken up temporary residence for the festival by sitting down at tables, but in a kind of symbolic way, is it possible that Jesus sees them as having moved into the role filled by rabbis, <laughs> taken up their place? No longer are teachers who are given the responsibility to share the words of the law and prophets at the center of activity in this place of worship, but it's money changers and merchants. Would this get an emotional reaction of, out of anyone else? <laughs> At least in this moment, it seems direct engagement with the living God has been cast aside. Instead, the focus is on all of the activity around it. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. And in this story, we see some early connections to his conversation with the woman at the well when he will tell her that worship isn't about any physical location, it's about who we worship and the way we should worship in spirit and truth. His actions at the temple also seem to fulfill the words of the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, which says, and there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. It was a passage often understood as a reference to the coming Messiah and what would happen. This cleansing of the temple is the first event in John's gospel that pits Jesus against some of the powers that be, it's a disruption of commerce. This passage is often understood to be a critique of some kind of corruption. The accounts of this event in Matthew and Luke recall Jesus referring to another verse about a den of robbers, which people often hear as a reference perhaps to some kind of financial misconduct that must have been happening uh, amidst the money changers and merchants. But you know, here he simply says it's become a marketplace. Marketplaces aren't bad in themselves. It seems to be more about the location. And I want to take a moment to offer a little more understanding for why the merchants and money changers were there to begin with. They're not painted in the best terms, but I think we can gain a little more appreciation. The, that region was under the Roman Empire and Roman coins had images of the emperor's head who claimed to be God. This was considered sacrilegious and so those managing the temple set up a currency exchange to trade in Roman coins for the special coins in Jerusalem, thus the money changers. And then worship in the Old Testament related to making sacrifices at the temple. Most people making the pilgrimage to Jerusalem up the mountain couldn't carry animals along with them, so it was both necessary in some cases and convenient to buy them when they arrived. The merchants made this possible. So the presence of the money changers and merchants is more understandable, I think, in this way. The intent is good. Is it possible that exchange rates were a bit high and prices for animals higher than back home? You know, maybe kind of like gas and groceries are more expensive in a tourist area than it is back home. It's also true that the Roman Empire benefited from the sales at the temple since they controlled all of it. At least in John's retelling of the story, the problem isn't necessarily that there's egregious corruption or unjust practices happening in the course of the commerce. It's possible, but that's not what is highlighted here. The offense runs deeper. It's simply that attention has been taken away from the law and the prophets and the actual presence of God, and it's been taken up by everything but that, most notably the commerce filling the Temple Mount. And so after clearing the temple and bringing everything to a halt, the crowd asks, what sign can you show us for doing this. They want to see his proverbial badge. <laughs> what authority does he have to do this? And he responds a little cryptically, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What does that have anything, you know, to do with anything, Jesus? They said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and you're going to raise it up in three days? 
But John notes he was speaking of the temple of his body. Again, kind of a multi-layered statement. The temple itself would be destroyed later in 70 AD in response to the first Jewish revolt and Rome laying siege to Jerusalem. His statement alludes to that future, but Jesus in metaphor and symbolism is actually referring to himself. Why does he speak in such elusive terms? In an indirect way, he's foreshadowing his death and resurrection, and by citing his future death and resurrection, he will show who he is and affirm his authority to overturn the tables in the temple area. Jesus has disrupted the whole temple system during one of the busiest times of the year. Biblical scholar Gail O'Day says, Jesus challenges a religious system so embedded in its own rules and practices that it is no longer open to a fresh revelation from God. And that brings us back to where we started. It's possible for people of any time and place to build up rules and traditions and practices and requirements so much that we can't hear the voice of the living God anymore. Clarity allows for the voice of God to be heard. And so how do we keep wide open space to encounter God at the center of worship? What helps you encounter God? What gets in the way? Your answer may partly follow your personality and how you process information and experiences. But Martin Luther at the time of the Reformation advocated for reshaping worship to help people experience God's word and grace. He said that nothing else need ever happen except that our dear Lord himself may speak to us through his holy word and we respond to him through prayer and praise. That's the heart of worship that we still lift up in word and song. That's what Jesus was seeking to reclaim at the temple and what we still seek. So may you come each week anticipating an encounter with the living God and discover the one who by grace through faith loves you and invites you into a life of meaning. Amen. That's this week's message. You don't have to navigate the road ahead alone. You can join with others at All Saints. Visit allsaintsmtka.org for more information. Have a great week.